to the Giraffe Social Media Podcast. It's what social media managers are talking about. I'm Chloe Bellchamber, and on today's episode, I'm direct messaging VP of Sales at ClickBank, Dominic Keenan. We'll be discussing why affiliate marketing can hurt your business and what's working in affiliate marketing in 2022. But first, let me introduce you to today's guest. Welcome to the podcast, Dominic. Hey, thank you very much, Chloe. I really appreciate you having me on. Yeah, we're so happy that you're here today. Uh, where are you joining us from? So we are in beautiful Boise, Idaho. And for those of you not familiar with the States, it's uh, almost to Oregon and California. Very cool. Oh, it's nice to have a, an international uh, guest on the show today. <laughs> Yeah, well, we have a lot of overseas clients. So usually when you say Boise, Idaho, people I just are like, okay, where is that? <laughs> <laughs> I have to admit, I hadn't heard of that, but I'm I, Idaho I've heard of. So, you know, close enough. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, well, Dominic, you've been VP of sales at ClickBank for nearly seven years. So to kick us off, why don't you start by telling us what you guys do over there and how affiliate marketing has changed in your years of the business? Yeah, absolutely. So at ClickBank, and this is my favorite part of the job, is that I work with hundreds of great entrepreneurs constantly. Uh, and primarily, ClickBank helps entrepreneurs scale their online businesses so we're known as an affiliate network, obviously, and that's primarily primarily what we do. But we also have um, what we would call conversion enhancing features. So post-purchase, one-click upsells, subscriptions, recurring billing, uh, scaled merchant processing. Um, and the great part of what we do is just, as I mentioned earlier, working with entrepreneurs daily on strategy and tactics that continuously build the reach of of their businesses um and it's just it's been a phenomenal job to be able to be a portion of all of these very unique businesses in in my time here and affiliate marketing is often overlooked when brands begin to develop or evolve their marketing strategy. But ClickBank, who have worked with over 100,000 affiliates worldwide, know that they have the power to influence and educate a consumer during their purchase journey. Uh, Dominic, we're not going to be talking about that today, though. Uh, this episode, we're actually here to discuss why affiliate marketing can hurt your business. Yeah, that's a... That's a great question. So there are there are concerns around affiliate marketing, particularly when it comes to highly branded products that want to be able to control their brand. Um, so we know that, and there's there's features in there in the in the platform, and most affiliate networks will have the ability to do this, where no affiliate can promote your product unless they've been approved by you, the seller. Um, now, if you, if you want to let anybody promote it, that's an option too. But if you have a brand that you're pri trying to protect, we always encourage people to use that feature. For us, it's called whitelisting. And, you know, just about any network will have that. And uh, really, I encourage people to leverage that feature and then really get to know their affiliates before they let them promote them. So who are they? What have they promoted in the past? What are their traffic sources? Where do they intend to promote to promote your your product? But on top of that, it gives you a chance to tell them, hey, we don't, we don't want you doing these types of tactics, right? We don't want you bidding on our brand keywords. Um, perhaps you have an exclusive with an agency that runs all your Facebook traffic, so no Facebook affiliates allowed or email only. Um, but that only works if a company is willing to invest in the relation, building a relationship with their affiliates, which we encourage all the time, whether they're using ClickBank or not, you know, certainly build a relationship with those people. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I suppose one of the most common questions that you guys hear is, should I use affiliate marketing in my industry? And while, you know, you and I as marketers, you know, we're pretty optimistic, but we're also realists. And the fact is, not every industry does fit within the affiliate marketing model, right? Yeah, that's very true. So it's funny you bring this up because just earlier this week, I, I had a, a product come across my desk and, and one of the newer employees here was asking me, would this be a good fit? And it was like a, a $5,000 air compressor 
for welding shops. And that's a pretty niche market, <laughs> I would assume. I, maybe <laughs> I don't know much about welding, but maybe not. Um, and that's an example of a product that's probably not going to be a great fit for affiliate marketing because it's a very narrow distribution for demand. And then also, I would imagine that $5,000 air compressors don't have a ton of margin to go out and acquire customers. So when, when, we, when we look at, at products that are able to attract broad affiliate uptake, it's products that have enough margin to be able to go out and pay an affiliate to acquire a customer for them. Um, and if margins are too narrow, another, another example of that that came across was a, a t-shirt store. And this t-shirt store has like 10 new designs every day. And you can only buy it that day, right? And it's like 10 or $12 for a t-shirt. Um, they are not able to, because you have the cost of the shirt, you have the cost of the fulfillment, the cost of your overhead. Um, so they don't, they might be able to pay a dollar to acquire a customer. On the other side, some of the uh, higher scaled offers that we see on ClickBank uh, are in the supplement space where, you know, you might have a cart value of two, two to $250. Um, cost of goods and supplements is relatively low compared to that price point. And so then that's where you start to see broad affiliate uptake where you can pay $100 to acquire a customer. That gets an affiliate really excited about it because they know that they can be ROI positive as they go out, whether it's social media, email, however they're um, driving traffic for you. And those types of offers scale really quickly. Um, one thing to keep in mind, our, uh, vendors are always competing for customers, right? We were just talking about supplements where is it this supplement or that supplement that somebody's going to buy today? But uh, sellers are also competing for affiliates just as much as they compete for customers. And oftentimes that comes down to conversion rate and how much, how much a seller can pay an affiliate to get a customer for them. Mm -hmm. And are there any cases you've seen where affiliate marketing has actually cost a business time and money with no success? Yeah, I... This is a great question, and I, I think uh, I, I think everybody who's considering this should take this into account that affiliates should be viewed as a channel, um, and any channel that you're investing in takes time and money and effort. Um, you know, I, I can only imagine for you guys with your clients if somebody said, "Oh, I really want to get into YouTube, but I want to do it for free." Uh, that that's not going to work, right? <laughs> it, it, yeah. it, 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 it's not cost free. Um, there's no channel that's cost free. And so I, I always encourage people to invest time and effort into testing and optimizing specifically for affiliates. Don't just put an affiliate link at the footer of your web page and just wait for people to come find it. They're, they're not out there looking for it. Like we were talking about, you know, sellers are all competing for affiliates as well. And so affiliates tend not to just cruise random websites looking for an affiliate link at the bottom, at the bottom of the page. Um, so that, uh, viewing it as a channel, investing in the, in, in the optimization. And then one other uh, key step is hiring a really good affiliate manager. And I, and I, I don't mean somebody that is taking a look at the stats and making sure like PayPaling people money for their affiliate commission, right? It's, it's more people, an affiliate manager is out there building a relationship with everybody that is promoting your product and keeping it front of mind. Um, so that they know, Hey, we're doing a sale next month or Hey, we have this new marketing collateral that works really well. Uh, and putting it in front of them, really winning that competition for affiliates attention over other sellers. But to your question with no success, it's usually exactly what we were talking about. I put an affiliate link at the bottom of my page or an affiliate uh, uh, tools page at the bottom of my website and people will find it. Probably, probably not. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious then, because I guess I and we at Giraffe are probably a bit more familiar with influencer marketing than we are with affiliate marketing. What are the kinds of affiliates that are out there? Because I'm sort of picturing individuals who are out you know, posting on Instagram with little swipe up links, but it's much more to that, right? Yeah. So I, I, it's interesting 
and I would love your take on this because I see influencer marketing as as one click off from affiliate marketing in that at least the types of affiliates that we're working with are scaled oftentimes cold traffic affiliates so they're looking for a high converting offer that they can promote either on paid Facebook or native ad networks that makes up about half of our affiliate base and I mean you're talking about affiliates that can easily do several several hundred thousand dollars in sales a day um, the other half of it is uh, email email affiliates and email is certainly not dead it uh, it performs very very well very consistently and a lot of the uh, affiliates that we're working with on the email side have highly segmented lists so they're just constantly looking for a tailored offer to that list the way we help them down the down the road is like hey here's the email copy that's working for this type of audience you know weight loss audience is it specifically a keto audience that you're um, you're talking to or not um, on the influencer side it's a little more difficult to track because we we pay on performance and so instead of hey here's a fee to make a post we'll pay you as you generate sales for us and mm -hmm. I don't the models feel a little different I, I'd be curious what your your take is on that though yeah it's almost like it's easier to track kind of the KPIs and the ROI when you're using affiliate marketing because there's that commission factor and, and you can see on the website you know how many purchases have come from this specific affiliate whereas influence marketing unless you're providing maybe uh, a unique discount code to that influencer it's a little bit harder to gauge if there have any uh, if any purchases have come through from you know as as a consequence of that post so I think you're right I think they do have quite sort of different uh, like networks and avenues but um, yeah I'm interested I guess to see which sort of outperforms or if they're kind of just as successful as the other yeah that I, I, I would love somebody to do that case study we've talked about it for quite a while around <laughs> here um, just because you can measure one thing more precisely than another doesn't necessarily mean the thing that you're really good at measuring outperforms the other thing it just means you you know a little bit more about it Totally. This is our official open call for someone to put together a case study on that. That would be super interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yes, please do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, Dominic, even if your business model is right for an affiliate marketing strategy, there are still plenty of pitfalls and mistakes that could cost you that return on investment, right? So can you walk us through a few of those? Yes, absolutely. So um, I would say the number one mistake is uh, sellers or vendors that are testing on affiliate traffic, optimizing their pages on it. That is the best way to ruin your relationship with uh, with your affiliates. It's unfortunately common um, with undisciplined sellers. If, if you're going to test and optimize something, do it before you put it in front of the affiliate because they're not interested. They're, they're putting out the cash for that for that traffic. They're not interested in your test. So I, I strongly discourage that. Um, you know, we talked about poor affiliate relationships earlier, and I constantly encourage people to build direct relationships with their affiliates. A lot of that has to do with your affiliate manager. Um, a couple other things beyond that, though, uh, at least with the group of sellers that we work with on ClickBank, they uh, almost always have affiliate tools pages. Um, those tools pages will include uh, the types of copy that are working well, details about the offer and the audiences that it converts on, um, banner images for people that are promoting on display or swipe copy for people that uh, are emailing. But I uh, also encourage people to be really transparent in how those pages are put together. So for ClickBank, we, we spoke earlier about post-purchase upsells and an affiliate's not going to be able to see those upsells unless they buy the product and then buy everything that's in that flow um, instead of making an affiliate go through that because now it's kind of like what's next right is it it's a $30 product up front and then do you have a $200 recurring product that's not going to convert or is it 45 after does the page look good um, just diagram that out and eliminate all confusion. So diagram it out, say here's all the links to every upsell, 
here's the prices, here's the rates at which they convert, here's the average order value for your entire funnel. If you want to see front of funnel where you know you may have some lead capture quiz in front of it, put it there too. Um, don't make them guess just based on being able to see one landing page. Uh, and that, because that, I, in the end, if they really want to see it, they're going to buy the product and see it. Like, you might as well just be as transparent as, as possible. Um, but in the end, definitely keep in mind, we're all, every seller is competing for affiliates too. So uh, put just as much effort into that as, as competing for buyers. Nice. Well, let's talk about brand integrity because it's a measure of how buyers perceive a company across all of its touch points. Um, with affiliate marketing, I feel as though protecting a brand's integrity is made a lot harder for marketers who are managing these complex and interdependent ecosystems that also include affiliates, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, oftentimes the brands that we're working with, they will have built their business by being good at one or two channels typically. Uh, so it will be like one of the great supplement brands that I started working with uh, seven years ago when I first started here. They were just getting going on ClickBank. Um, it's this greens juice uh, um, product. And uh, they had some great YouTube videos. Like they just killing it on YouTube. And then they in-house their uh, Facebook capabilities so that, you know, they hired their media buyers, brought them in-house, did really well with that. And they controlled that, those two channels. They would not allow any affiliates to promote in that. But then as uh, affiliates ap applied to be able to promote this product, uh, what they said was, you're not allowed to promote on, on the two that we're competent in. Here's the others that we're okay with. Um, and if you're going to promote us on these others, here's how you're going to, you know, talk about our product and you can't, you know, bid on our terms and all of those things, um, which is great. But in the end, you have to, you have to go back and have that affiliate manager checking. Is somebody else bidding on those, on those keywords? You don't have to do it, you know, constantly, but put a calendar reminder of once a month who's bidding on a, who's bidding against us or who's promoting us on TikTok and all of these things you can go in and see that and and we constantly encourage that because the worst thing that can happen is let it go for like a year and you realize that your brand to some audience on on a different social media channel is completely different than what you wanted it to be on the channels that you own set clear expectations and then just trust but verify Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what about fraud? Because I read that in 2020, fraud cost the affiliate marketing sector $1.4 billion, which is crazy. And this typically occurs because the fraudsters take advantage of flaws in the tracking system or attribution and then submit false or unfair claims for commissions. I'm interested to know, Dominic, how agencies and platforms like ClickBank are helping push against fraud in the industry. Yeah, I, that's, that's a great question. So for affiliate fraud, ClickBank's a little bit different because ClickBank controls the order form and controls the money. So if we catch somebody doing that, cookie stuffing is most common, right? Well, we just, we just don't pay them and we give the money back. Um, mm -hmm. that, that's a convenience of our business model. Um, but one of the other things that we did so uh, 15 years ago, our founder realized that there was a lot of uh, transactional fraud that occurs, which I think people that are concerned about affiliate fraud should be just as concerned about transactional fraud. So he founded our sister company, which is called Count, um, which was just last year acquired by Equifax. And it will analyze every transaction that we have, every sign up. It'll say, hey, this affiliate is the last 10 transactions they sent resulted in a chargeback or resulted in a refund within a certain period of time. Um, all of that to say, even if you don't have that complex of a tool, I would keep a really close eye on customer service inbound and then return rates. Um, we catch a lot of them, honestly, by because we have a call center. So if you buy something through one of our sellers, you can call our customer service as well. We catch a lot of them by starting to see like, hey, this product has a, you know, like 2% refund rate 
And I'll, we have this affiliate that has a 30% refund rate in two days. Like, let's go in, mm-hmm. find out what's wrong with it. Um, and usually that's how that's how we're able to catch them. There's, there's other tools, you know, sophisticated tools, kind of like Count, that you can put in and try to customize to yourself. But that's the easiest way to find it is monitoring the quality rates and the customer service inbound. Mm-hmm. Um, we kind of touched on influencer marketing just before, and I'm interested to know if you think the similarities are so much so that this wouldn't be your answer. Um, but if after this episode, you know, our listeners are coming to the realization that affiliate marketing isn't right for them, or maybe the risks outweigh the outcome, what are some other avenues that they can pursue? Well, so I would, first off on the on the affiliate network, I, I think if you... If you came to clickbank.com and you looked at what else we sell and you're like, oh, I just, you know, that they probably don't have affiliates for me, uh, that could be true. I would say there's also a lot of niche networks out there that are specific to an industry. And take a look at that. One of my favorite businesses out there is a company called Avant Link. They're out of Park City, Utah. Um, and if you're familiar with Park City, the uh, Olymp- Winter Olympics were there. Big outdoor town just outside of Salt Lake. Huge skiing town. And AvantLink built a business around outdoor brands. Um, So pretty much every, like, backpack and ski binding and all of this stuff, they represent all of those brands. So just because you go to one or two affiliate networks and it doesn't quite look right, um, if you're selling a ski binding, definitely call AvantLink. Like, they they have traffic for you, (laughs) and they're great to work with. Beyond that, um, if, if affiliate marketing is not... For you, say you're selling the five thousand dollar compressor for the uh, for the <laughs> welders, um, I would uh, take a look at ambassador programs. Um, there's a bunch of companies that do that and do that pretty well. That's a little bit easier for um, your the the affiliate or ambassador to understand and get on board with, right? They're just kind of word of mouth or small social media followings. Um, and then the last thing I would think of would be. Uh, work directly with, um, you could say an affiliate, but an agency by channel. Um, the advantage of affiliates is you get this broad distribution across a lot of a, a lot of different channels. But really, if you want to break into YouTube or Facebook or whatever it may be, and you don't want to in-house the talent to do it, um, there's a, a lot of really competent agencies out there that will break you into that market um, and, at, you know, hopefully a lower effort than than building an affiliate marketing Mm -hmm. uh, program. Definitely. Now, you've been at ClickBank for seven years, so, you know, you've been in the business a little while. uh, And, you know, we both know the world of online marketing is changing daily. And, you know, what works today might not work tomorrow. And I feel like this is quite apparent in, you know, affiliate marketing as well. So, Are there any affiliate strategies that businesses are using today that simply don't work anymore? Well, there's, yeah, there's a lot that's gone by the (laughs) wayside. Um, You know, in the the email world has gotten a lot tighter. Um, I don't want to say like spam won't work anymore, but email is much, to perform properly, it's got to be much better than just like one click above spam. Um, the ESPs just won't tolerate it anymore. I've got a good friend that runs uh, runs an ESP down in, in San Diego, and he, he was talking about this, the kind of the rising tide of, of quality has improved. Um, so it'd be really specific in, in the quality, whether it's email or, or um, display, like uh, – bad display campaigns just don't convert anymore. Um, the The conversion rates are low. The refunds are high. Uh, people feel misled. Um, you know, you. Uh, I listen to a bunch of podcasts, and, and you kind of hear people who've been around the – I don't know how long you've been in the industry, Chloe, but you, you've run into those people that are like, oh, back in the day it was the Wild West on <laughs> Google Display or whatever. Um it, that that kind of stuff is is gone. Um, it doesn't doesn't work anymore. Uh, and then the other thing when it comes to affiliate strategies, just to just to keep in mind, a, a lot of our clients are re, uh, relying on Facebook media. Uh, keep a close eye on the policy changes. I, I mean, they change very frequently. We just went through the iOS 14 thing, which is a big one. Um, but uh, those have a way of 
if somebody's not paying attention, they'll they'll come back and bite you pretty bad. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, so you don't need to talk to me about the the iOS fourteen update. We <laughs> we've been battling that here too. Yeah, it's, it's a big one. <laughs> yeah, that made for a fun twenty twenty one. Well, despite the ever-changing nature of the digital marketing world and, you know, the meta world alone, uh, there are some evergreen foundations for affiliate marketing that never change. Can you talk us through those? Yeah, I I mean, I would put a strong priority on um, the customer's perception of value of what they're receiving. And that that's not just the thing that they get that they bought, but the the email that they opted in that they received from you, the sales page, all of it, the, the whole feeling of it. Customers are really discerning and you had this huge jump forward in the past two years of people buying online. Um, I always joke, my my grandma's like 79, I think, uh, lives in a smaller town. And um, she told me a couple months ago how much she loves Uber Eats. There's no way without the pandemic she would have ever used Uber Eats. Right, and so the, um, the the market got really big, really fast, and people are really comfortable, uh, much more comfortable buying online. But they're also more discerning, um, so keeping their perception um, at the top of the list. And then for our clients, I would just say uh, constant improvement, um, whether it's sales pages, emails, ads, all of that. There's, I you know, doing this for a while, I've seen a lot of big sellers come and go. And oftentimes they feel like they've made it, right? Like this is generating X number of hundreds of thousands a day. um, And they just kind of rest on their laurels. And all of a sudden it's just not converting anymore. Affiliates are going elsewhere. Um, So that's one thing to keep in mind. Then lastly, uh, circling, I know I mentioned this a couple of times, but it is critical is uh, building those great relationships with affiliates. If, If you especially if you get a chance to go to a conference or a mastermind or whatever it may be and meet those people in person, uh, they will do so, the relationship will be so much deeper. And if we have time, I've got a really quick story on this in, in, um, in relationship building. Uh, a couple of years ago, we were at the Traffic and Conversion Conference in San Diego, and we had this uh, VIP room, which was for our top-level clients, and we had... Um, a big speaker, I can't, I can't even remember who it was, but, uh, you know, it's a room for like 50 people and there's about 90 people packed in it and people trying to get in and some YouTube influencers trying to bring his camera crew in with all the bright lights and everything. And so my boss looks at me and he's like, don't, it makes me guard the door. At this time, I'm just an affiliate manager, right? So I, I stand by the door, people keep trying to come in and this, this one lady came in and she didn't have the pass to be in there and uh so i said you know i'm really sorry um yeah you'll have to wait until this is over and she just uh she looked at me and she's like honestly i just want to sit in the back of the room and learn and meet as many people as i can i won't be in your way and if at any point you want me to leave i will um so i let her stay she was just so much nicer than the youtube influencer bright lights (laughs) walking in everybody um and it turns out she had built this great business on uh, she suffered from chronic back pain built this great business called back to life uh, based on her ability to network and really connect with people like she she really gets to know the people that she's working with Um, I I mean within a year and a half that was a multi multi multi-million dollar business one of the best businesses on Clickbank currently Um, but all that came about by being persistent getting in and meeting the people that were gonna have the best impact on her business and she's done very well since then. And I, I would say a great friend as well. Oh, amazing. That's a great story. Uh, my final question, Dominic, that I like to ask all of our guests in their specific industries is, what does the future of affiliate marketing look like for you? Uh, so we just got done talking about iOS 14 and how, you know, that was <laughs> that was fun. Um, I, I th- I think there will constantly be things like that, you know, that continue to come, whether it's uh, changes to iOS, they're now making changes to the email side, um, the Facebook algorithm, GDPR for those of you in, in um, the EU and and uh, CCPA here in the US. Those will certainly continue, but um, 
I'm very optimistic about the the industry. I, the marketers that I've worked with are phenomenal at adapting. They understand exactly where the performance is, and you know it may be a short term hit, and it may change the way we go about things, but. I, I have a lot of confidence in their ability to uh, to adapt to those to those changes. So that would be um, there's going to be days where it's like, oh God, how are we going to deal with this change? But in the end, <laughs> um, in the end, I'm I'm very confident in our industry's ability to adapt. Absolutely. See, that market is optimistic. It's like I said. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I. Uh, I remember the first, I can't remember exactly what it was, but when I first started at ClickBank, there was some, you know, algorithm change or whatever. And I was just like, oh God, did I make a bad decision coming to work here? Like, <laughs> is this the end? And after you've seen it a couple times, you, you realize like, ah, oh, the, the industry will, will adapt for sure. Totally, totally. <laughs> Uh, well, Dominic, before we wrap things up, we like to do what we call the rapid recommendation segment where we find out what our guests have been loving and what they can't live without. So are you ready for me to throw a few more questions yeah, at you? Yeah, absolutely. Alrighty. I want to know, firstly, what's one app or tool that you simply can't work without? Uh two things so i'm very meticulous about my calendar um i use mm -hmm. outlook calendar which i'm a little embarrassed to admit but it's very <laughs> um very precise and up to date so it's everything from like personal life um to uh to my professional life but i would highly recommend just putting that in in one place my wife uses like five different google calendars <laughs> <laughs> um, beyond that, you mentioned tool, and I know this isn't an online tool, but uh, if there was one product that I lost and I would immediately purchase, like I would leave at lunch and go repurchase it, is uh, my Apple AirPods. Um, I'm going to walk downstairs and I'm going to listen to a podcast for three minutes on my walk down and three minutes on my walk up. and. I'm able to consume, listen to a lot of audiobooks and podcasts that way. So I'm a, I'm a huge fan of, of these little things. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I'm with you on that one. I mean, we, we both got them in. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, my second question is who is one brand or persona that you think is getting social media right at the moment? Um, this may, uh, so. For those of you outside of the U.S., this may not be as relevant, but I have a lot of admiration for a, a woman, younger woman named um, Annie Agar, I believe it is, A-G-A-R. -A um, I follow her on Twitter. Um, she wanted to get, from what I understand, wanted to get into sports broadcasting, and then the pandemic hit and all everybody's life reshuffled. So she started making um, very creative uh, Instagram and Twitter videos about the NFL. Um, is brilliant because she's a brilliant writer and the, I mean, she's doing these videos like in her living room. Um, she's a brilliant writer and it's very funny, but she also attached herself to a very big brand that has a massive following, right? So I, re I remember the first time I saw one, you're sending it to everybody because this is hilarious. Um, mm -hmm. I see that she's gotten several sponsorship deals. I think Microsoft even is one of her sponsorship deals. So I just have a lot of admiration wow. for somebody. I'm guessing she's in her early to mid-20s. It's, it's worth taking a look at, at what she's built by just being creative. I mean, she has these conversations as if she's multiple team members, and all she's doing is wearing one team shirt, and then it cuts to her and another team shirt. It's not super complicated. It was just really creative at the time. Uh -huh. Oh, amazing. I'll have to check her out after this. Uh, and finally, what's one valuable resource or event or group that you think our listeners should know about? And that can be based in the U.S. or worldwide, whatever. Um, so if, if you are in the U.S. or want to travel to the U.S., I'm a big fan of the Traffic and Conversion Conference. Um, it is there's a, there's a lot of conferences in the space. That one, our company, our team, by far invest the most there because of the quality of the rooms there and the quality of the speakers, they do a phenomenal job with that. Um, for those of you that don't want to travel to San Diego for a conference, I recently uh, read a book that I then had our entire team read um, called uh, Alchemy by Rory Sutherland. And uh, have you had a chance to read this book, Chloe? I have not, but I'm excited to hear about it. <laughs> so he, 
Um, worked for a large agency in the UK, market, traditional marketing agency. I, I don't remember the name of it. Um, but he gives just all these great stories about his career and, and working for this agency and all the clients that he worked with. Um, and it was really interesting to see online, to see, uh, I should say, offline tactics, tactics that work kind of in traditional marketing that mimic the psychology of what we use online. So he was doing stuff back in the 70s on billboards and ways to lay out merchandise and things like that, that you you read it and you realize that's pretty much what we're doing. It's just online instead. Um, I highly recommend that book. Flew through it. Got great, great uh, feedback from our team about it. Amazing. Well, I'll have to add it to the, the giraffe team's reading list as well. I, I highly recommend uh, the audiobook version. He has one of those really great British accents. Oh, amazing. Definitely listening to the audiobook then. <laughs> Well, that's all we've got time for today, but thank you so much for joining me, Dominic. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe if you're listening on Apple Podcasts or give us a follow if you're listening on Spotify. We would love to know what you thought about today's interview, so make sure you reach out on social media and let us know what you thought. We've been Giraffe Social Media. You've been amazing. We'll see you next time.